Today on America's Test Kitchen, Julia shows Bridget how to make flat, hand-pulled noodles. Adam reveals his top pick for meat cleavers. And Dan makes Julia the ultimate Chinese-style barbecued spare ribs. It's all coming up right here on America's Test Kitchen. It's a fun day here in the test kitchen because we're making noodles from the Shaanxi province of China. Now they're called Bang Bang Mian and they're flat and they're hand pulled. Now they get that great name because of the noise they make as you shape them. So turn up the volume, sit back, Julia's coming in here and we're going to show you how to make this great dish. They're delicious but more importantly they are fun exactly. to make. And it's all about the noodles. We found that the texture of the noodle can really vary. It can be really tough and hard, or on the opposite end, it could be very mushy, almost like a rice noodle. We want Goldilocks right in the middle. Right in the middle. And these mm -hmm. are pretty wide, flat noodles. Yes, yeah. they're rustic. <laughs> this is my favorite kind of food because that means it's messy on purpose. Perfect. <laughs> we want a nice chewy noodle because that's the hallmark of these noodles. So we're going to start with bread flour because okay. bread flour has a higher level of protein, more protein, more chew. Gotcha. So this is two and a third cups of bread flour. To it, we're going to add three quarters of a teaspoon of salt. Whisk that together. Now we're going to add just a little bit of oil. This is a tablespoon of vegetable oil. And finally, some water. This is a cup of water. And now I'm going to let the stand mixer do all the work, because again, we really want to build up that gluten, really knead the dough so we get some good chew. So I'm going to start it on low speed for just a minute or two to get the dough to come together. So I'm just going to stop it real quickly, just scrape down any flour that's stuck to the side of the bowl so that dough can come together just a little faster. You can see all that flour is now hydrated and it's forming a nice dough. So now's the time to turn it to medium and let it go for about 10 minutes. Okay. You can see what a transformation this dough made after 10 minutes of kneading. That gluten is pumped <laughs> up. So now we're just gonna put this on the counter and give it a few kneads. So you can see this dough is very supple. It's very smooth. It really and is. It's snapping back. Mm -hmm. That's all that gluten structure. So I'm just going to give it a few kneads for about 30 seconds or so. Really make sure it's a nice round ball so then we eventually shape it. It's just a little easier. Okay. There we go. Now I'm just going to shape it into a nine inch log. I'm going to wrap it tightly in plastic wrap. Now we have to let this refrigerate and relax for at least 12 hours, but you can do it up to 48 hours ahead. All right. So Julia worked really hard to get that gluten activated in the dough. And if we tried to shape the noodles now, it would just snap right back. So let's take a little look at why that is. This is the gluten network we just formed. And it has lots of temporary bonds that hold the dough tightly together. That's why at this stage, the dough is really hard to stretch. Letting the dough relax overnight in the fridge allows gluten to stretch more easily because many of those temporary bonds within the gluten network release. After the relaxation period, it's still a strong network, but it's much less tense and elastic. So when we form it into a noodle, it stays stretched. It doesn't tear or snap back as much. And that's why the overnight rest is key to our chewy noodles. All right, so the dough is rested, and before we work with it, we're gonna make a quick sauce. Now, you can put lots of different kinds of sauces on these noodles, but we're gonna make a spicy chili oil. It's an oil-based sauce, so here I have half a cup of vegetable oil, and I'm just gonna add some flavorings to that so it's very aromatic. All right. Starting with some garlic. We're gonna use two large cloves of garlic, and we're just gonna slice them thin. And they don't have to be paper thin, because okay. they're gonna be strained out eventually. So that's two cloves of sliced garlic. That goes into the pot. Next, this is a one inch piece of ginger and we're just gonna peel it. You could use a paring knife if you want and just slice away. So for this, again, we're just gonna slice it thinly. All right, now for some fun. <laughs> Szechuan peppercorns. This is a tablespoon of these guys. You know, they're not that spicy, but they do that tingly thing on your mouth. So this is a tablespoon. Julia just mentioned they're not that spicy. Well, they're not really peppercorns either. They're actually the dried outer husk of a seed pod from the prickly ash shrub. And they contain a compound called hydroxy alpha sensual. And they react with the receptors on your tongue and your lips and make you feel like you're numb. <laughs> just a few more things we're gonna add to the oil. We're gonna add half a cinnamon stick and one star anise pod. I'm just gonna put this over medium high heat for a couple minutes till it's sizzling, and then I'm gonna turn it down and let it go for about 10 minutes till the garlic is lightly round. Okay. In the meantime, let's talk about the spice. So we're gonna use these beauties. These are bird chilies. They're dried Thai chilies. And in terms of spiciness, they're about 10 times spicier than a jalapeno. They are spicy, mm -hmm. yes. And we're gonna use a lot of them. 
You can use anywhere from 10 to 20. I picked sweet 16. We're gonna have 16 chilies for the two of us. Grind them up in a spice grinder, seeds and all. Just make sure all the stems have been removed. Okay. And here we go. All right. Just gonna put these dried chilies in a bowl and we're gonna save them for later. Okay. Now, we can see this has come up to a nice sizzle, so we're gonna turn it down to low. I'm gonna let it continue to cook for 10 to 12 minutes, again, until that garlic turns a very light golden. Beautiful aromas coming from this saucepan mm -hmm. right now. Here we have the dough that's been rested for at least 12 hours, and we'll put it on an oiled counter. Now, this is a squeeze bottle filled with vegetable oil, and a little oil just helps prevent from sticking just a little bit. I'm gonna cut this into six pieces. That's just gonna make it much easier for us to pull the noodles. All right, so again, oiling the counter. I'm gonna set these up here. We're just gonna let them rest for about 20 minutes okay. before we start stretching. Sounds good. All right, so it's been just over 10 minutes and you can see that garlic has turned a nice golden. Toasty. And so all those flavors are now in the oil. All right, so we're just gonna set this aside. You wouldn't wanna let that go too much more or the garlic would burn and get scorched flavored, That's right? That's it. And now we're gonna come back to our chilies. Now I'm gonna put a strainer over the bowl and I'm gonna strain the oil over the chilies. So the hot oil will bloom the chilies and the strainer will catch all these solids so they don't wind up in our sauce. You can see the oil has changed color. It sure has. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna add just a few more ingredients to this to finish the sauce. We have two tablespoons of soy sauce. And now we have a special ingredient here. It's two tablespoons of black vinegar, which is a specialty ingredient that you have to go to an Asian market for. It's a, like a light balsamic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Actually, balsamic vinegar is a great substitute if you can't find Chinese black vinegar. But if you do find it, it's worth seeking out because it's a lovely flavor. It really is. We're gonna add one mm. tablespoon of toasted sesame oil. It's the good stuff. Mm -hmm. And just a teaspoon of sugar to balance out the acidity and that heat. Great. And that is our oil sauce. We're gonna set this aside now and we're just waiting on that dough to finish resting so we can pull some noodles. All right, so it is time to bang, bang some noodles. Excellent. First thing you wanna do is make sure the counter is pretty well oiled, because as you saw before, the dough is quite sticky. I'm gonna take this nice piece of dough, you can see how slack it is. It sure is. I'm gonna put it right down there, and I'm just gonna start by pressing it out into something about seven by three inches. Okay. And then you pick up the ends, and you start slapping. Pulling and slapping. And here you go, you're going for about 32 to 36 inches wide. Okay. And so this is quite thin. And then to make noodles, you take the center and you pull. And it's a little stuck in the middle, just take a bench scraper or a knife and cut it in half. And that is a hand pulled noodle. Again, again. <laughs> <laughs> I have a nice long piece of plastic wrap here. We're just gonna keep these noodles covered so they don't dry out until we're ready to cook them. So I'm just gonna start by pressing this out and you pick up the ends and you start slapping. Actually what's happening is the dough goes up and down. You're stretching and relaxing that gluten. So you're looking again for about eh, 32 to 36 inches long. That's good. And you take the center, you tear it with your fingers and you pull it apart. And we'll cut this noodle here. All right, and you notice I'm laying them down so they don't touch. Cause again, this dough's pretty sticky. Right. And those noodles will stick to each other. All right, you are up. Seven by three inch yeah, roughly. rectangle. Oh, you were paying attention. <laughs> All right, pick it up by the ends. It just stretches so easily, doesn't it? It, it really does. And then, right in the middle, like mm -hmm. this, pinch here. Pinch there. Split it. Split it. Oh, that's satisfying. Right? Whoa. Here, I need it. there you go. How'd I do? You did amazing. Gonna bang out the rest of these noodles. Then we can get to cooking and eating. We'll start with boiling the noodles. Here I have four quarts of water, and I'm gonna add to it one tablespoon of table salt. Now, the tricky part is getting the noodles from here to there. Right. And I learned a trick. You use your arm, and you can keep them separated. So we're gonna cook these noodles in two batches, so that's six of these long hand-pulled noodles per batch. And they don't really need to cook for very long, only about a minute or so. We're just gonna gently stir these so that they don't clump together in the water. You can see they're starting to float, which looks good. The texture of mm -hmm. them looks cooked. Nice big fat noodles. Mm-hmm. All right, so we're just gonna take them out of the water, let them drain for a second, right into that mm -hmm. hot oil. Ooh, we'll set those aside and we'll just finish cooking this second batch before we eat. That's the last little noodle. Mm. Just gonna make sure we toss it with that gorgeous, super spicy oil I made us. <laughs> 
the heat from the noodles is really blooming all those spices awake. All right, here we go. They're rustic, they're long. They're endless. They're spicy. Now, if you want to top your noodles, you have some cilantro and some scallions there, All which right. I highly suggest. All right, beautiful. <laughs> Long, spicy noodles with chopsticks. Only for you. Means one thing, the bowl goes here. Uh, exactly. Closer to the mouth. <laughs> <laughs> mm. So good. Mm -hmm. Oh, the little bit of vinegar and the soy sauce, and you get the hint of garlic and ginger, and that perfectly chewy noodle. These are so satisfying. I expected 16 bird chilies, mm -hmm. but with all of the noodles, all the starch going in there, it's not overwhelming for I the know. palate. Isn't that crazy? From beginning to end, this was so simple, beautifully balanced. So good, aren't You're they? You're a keeper. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> if you'd like to make these chewy noodles at home, mix bread flour with water and oil, then chill. Create a spicy vinaigrette infused with garlic, ginger, and Sichuan peppercorns. Pour over ground Thai bird chilies, and then stir in soy sauce, black vinegar, and sesame oil. Stretch and bang those pieces of dough into fat, wide noodles. Boil, toss with the vinaigrette, and top with cilantro and scallion. So from our test kitchen to your kitchen, a fun and a little loud recipe for flat and full noodles, AKA Bang Bang Mian. For most home butchery jobs, all you need is a really good chef's knife and maybe a boning knife. But if you're gonna get into the heavy duty stuff, you might have to haul out a meat cleaver. Or do you really need one? Well, we're gonna ask Adam, who's gonna tell us if these are necessary or not. What do you think? My answer to that, Bridget, is how do you feel about your chef's knife? You mean, do I love it? <laughs> do you wanna do preserve it? its <laughs> edge? Gotcha. I'll tell you, meat cleavers are great for the jobs that could possibly damage and certainly wear down the cutting edge of a chef's knife. Heavy jobs, like cutting through raw chicken, cutting through whole lobsters or big crabs, maybe splitting a really hard winter squash like a butternut squash. Sure. Also, they're great if you make a lot of stock at home because you can cut the meat or the poultry right. into smaller pieces that exposes bone and flesh for more flavor extraction. And there are other things you can do. You can crush garlic cloves. You can use the spine of it to crack a coconut. That's one of my favorite, <laughs> favorite tricks. <laughs> Love that one. And you can cut up roasted meats with bones into bite-sized serving mm -hmm. pieces. So we were curious. We tested 13 different meat cleavers. Check out this price span. The low was $10.67. The high was $179.95. That's a huge difference. It's a huge difference. Now, there are three basic styles of these things. The first one is this really mm -hmm. heavy, thick-bladed, kind of axe-like Western style That's what meat you cleaver. think of when you think meat cleaver. This is the classic <laughs> American meat cleaver. This one is more of a Chinese-style meat cleaver because the blade is a little bit thinner, mm -hmm. a little bit lighter, and it's more rectangular. And then this one is sort of a hybrid of the two. And that's more like a vegetable cleaver in some cases. Gotcha. Now let me tell you about the test that we did. Testers used all the cleavers to chop four pounds of chicken wings, five pounds of chicken leg quarters, and large butternut squashes into quarters. They also used them to break down whole roast ducks, chopping them into serving size pieces. The range in weight was between about 10 or 11 ounces at the low to one pound, five ounces at the high. This is one of the heaviest ones, and you have a copy of it right in All front right. there. Why don't you try chopping a couple serving pieces of duck with this thing? Sorry. Oh! Yep, that's pretty easy. Now why don't you try the other one there, which is this one. This was a lot lighter at 15 ounces. All right, it's a bit more nimble, I can tell already. Yeah. Yep, it slides through very quickly. For some of the testing tasks, testers and butchers alike felt that that heavy weight was sort of overkill mm -hmm. for a lot of the testing tasks. Now, the lightest weight cleavers were a little too light. They mm -hmm. didn't really do the trick. So testers favored something more like 14, 15 ounces. Okay. In terms of the dimensions of the blades, the sweet spot was six and three quarter inches to seven and a quarter inches. Just as important as the dimensions of the blade were the cutting edge, and that gets down to the blade geometry or the bevels on either side of the blade. Like this guy here, this has a 30 degree bevel. That's a big difference. And it actually created sort of a sensation of dullness for some of the testers. Mm. It tended to wedge itself into bones rather oh. than cutting really cleanly through them. One of them had 17 degree bevels, which is a lot closer to the chef's knives. And this one felt keener, it felt sharper, therefore it felt a little easier to control for a lot of testers. Okay. 
Now, this is the winning cleaver that I have here. This is the Shun Classic Meat Cleaver. It's $149. Hmm. It's got 17 degree bevels on either side. It's a mid-weight cleaver at 15 ounces. The blade is a good size. It's not cheap though. And Tester's named a Best Buy. This one is the Lamson Products seven and a quarter walnut handle meat cleaver. It was $59.95. And this was actually the favorite cleaver of a couple of different testers. Well, there you go. If you're just getting into a little home butchery, then the Lamson is a great option. But if you're really dedicated to hacking through lots of things, including duck for dinner, you're gonna need the winner. It's the Shun Classic Meat Cleaver for $149. The problem with beets is that they stain absolutely everything. Look at this cutting board. Stained. Even if we wipe it down, stained. But here in the test kitchen, we have a trick. If you take vegetable spray and spray down your cutting board, before you chop anything that stains, like beets or pomegranates or raspberries, Take a clean paper towel, wipe, no stains. Look, it really works. Today we're making Chinese style barbecued ribs. But before we get cooking, let's take a minute to talk about buying ribs at the supermarket. Now there are three kinds of pork ribs you can buy. You can buy baby back ribs. They're a lot smaller than these others. And they're actually cut from up higher on the pig towards the spine. This is a full set of spare ribs. So you have the rib section here, and then you have this part. It's actually more of the belly of the pig, also known as the brisket. Or finally, you can buy our favorite, St. Louis style ribs, which is the full spare rib size, but just with this belly section cut off. And today, that's what we're gonna be cooking. Let's do it. <laughs> All right. So we're gonna work with two, two and a half to three pounds St. Louis style racks. I've got one cut up over here. We're gonna cut this one. Normally when we're cooking ribs, we come back here and we take the membrane off the mm -hmm. back. We're not gonna do that here. Oh, I love it, that makes it easy. It makes it easy and you know, these ribs, they're not gonna be quite as fall apart tender as the American style. They have a mm -hmm. little bit of chew to them. So we're just gonna leave that on. And I like that you're cutting them up because it makes them easier to eat, but also you get more surface area for the glaze. Exactly, yeah, more surface area and it's actually gonna improve our cooking time. These are gonna cook pretty fast. So I think the best way is to kind of look down here and you can see the two ribs. You just wanna go right between them. So now we've got two, two and a half to three pound racks here. It's time to work on the sauce. And we want a really intense flavor profile for this. We're gonna start with a lot of garlic and ginger. So we've got eight cloves of garlic. We're gonna use the food processor just because it's a fair amount to prep. And then I've got a six inch piece of ginger that Whoa, I sliced thin. That's a lot of ginger. A lot of ginger. And we'll just pulse this until it's broken down about 10 to 12 pulses. Great. All right, let's head over to our pot here. So this is unusual. We're gonna do this as a braise. Normally they're cooked whole, mm -hmm. and they're hung up in this really interesting oven. So they're not actually barbecued at all. Okay, so to build our braising liquid, we've got a cup of honey. We have three quarters of a cup of hoisin. Really salty, really savory, also a little bit sweet. Three quarters of a cup of soy sauce. A half a cup of Chinese rice wine. Here you could use dry sherry if you can't find that. Next up is two teaspoons of five spice powder. Mm. Now, if you left this out and you have all of these great ingredients here, if you leave this out, they're not gonna taste like Chinese spare ribs. <laughs> it really is such a key flavor. It all comes down to the five spice. Yep. Next up, I have a teaspoon of red food coloring. Most of the classic Chinese ribs you see have that gorgeous red color. And then finally, a teaspoon of white pepper. Okay. So you'll find that in the five spice, but we really wanna bump that up. So I'm just gonna stir this together. We have a half cup of water. All right, that is nice and combined. So now we're gonna go in with our ribs. These ribs won't be fully submerged in here. It's okay, we're gonna stir them a little bit as we cook. So I'm gonna bring this up to a simmer over high heat and we're gonna reduce to low, cover, and we're gonna cook for about an hour and a quarter. It's really all it takes to get them to the perfect amount of tenderness. Wow. Uh, but we're gonna do it on the stovetop so I can stir them and make sure they're really getting coated in that nice sauce. So that's not a lot of time. It isn't a lot of time, because we want them to be a little bit on the chewy side, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's been an hour and a quarter. Let's take a look at these. Ooh. Oh, they look so good. So let's check these with just a fork. That is perfect right there. So we want just a little bit of tenderness, a little bit of chew. Mm-hmm. Perfect. All right, so I'm gonna transfer these out of the braising liquid. Those look good already, and they're not even glazed yet. I know, right? All right, that's the last one. 
So there's a little more fat than we want here right now. So what I'm gonna do is strain it, but let it settle and skim a bit off. So we're gonna reduce this down to a nice glaze. It helps to get these solids out at this point. So we're gonna let this settle for about 10 minutes and then we'll skim off a little bit of that fat. So our fat is separated out nicely there and I'm just gonna use this wide spoon to take it off. Okay, that looks great. So we're gonna go back into our pot with our braising liquid. And this is super flavorful, but we're gonna to wanna to reduce it down. We really wanna glaze these just one time and have it really thick and really flavorful. So we're gonna reduce it down, but first I'm gonna add two tablespoons of toasted sesame oil. Mmm. Adds a ton of flavor. I'm gonna bring it up to a boil over high heat. We're gonna reduce it down to about two and a half cups. It's gonna get nice and syrupy. It's gonna take anywhere from 16 to 20 minutes. Okay, that looks perfect. Mm. So we're gonna go into a 425 degree oven with these and they're gonna be coated in this beautiful sticky glaze. That's a recipe for a smoky, <laughs> smoky oven. Yes, it is. So we wanna avoid that. So I have a rimmed baking sheet here and a wire rack and a half cup of water. I'm put the I also water see in the that bottom. you lined it with foil. That's for easy cleanup? Easy cleanup, exactly. So everything can drip down in there. It's not gonna smoke up the kitchen. So now I'm gonna transfer half of these ribs to our pot over here. Stand back. Oh yeah. <laughs> Mm. And I'm just gonna mm -hmm. stir to coat. Now look how nice and thick that glaze is. Clings beautifully to those. Things are looking good in there. Now I'm gonna transfer them bone side up to our baking sheet here. If there are any bones like that, you wanna face them into the middle. They're a little less likely to char that way. We're actually gonna flip these halfway through and we want them to finish with that beautiful meaty side up. Ah. So we're gonna go into a 425 degree oven. We're gonna cook these for about 10 to 14 minutes until they start to caramelize beautifully on the edge. And we're gonna flip them halfway through. Those look so good. They're beautiful. All right. This is some platter. We're not gonna have enough, I don't think. <laughs> one rack for you, one rack for me. <laughs> beautiful. Mm. Okay, are you ready to, yeah. ready to try these? Yes, I am. Oh, a couple for you. Perfect. Mmm. That's a good rib. That is so good. A little more chewy texture, right, mm -hmm. than a classic American rib. Tons of flavor, wow. Mm -hmm. You know, it's funny, there's only a little bit of five spice powder in there, but you can really taste it. Oh my God, it's, it's really potent, really nice. Yeah, it's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> it clean off the bone, didn't I? <laughs> yeah. These are terrific, and I love the recipe because it's so easy. Mm -hmm. Well done. Thank you. So if you want to make the best Chinese style ribs you've ever had, start with a puree of garlic and ginger and combine it with honey, poison, soy sauce, and five spice powder, along with a little red food coloring for fun. Add the ribs to the pot and cook over low heat until just tender, about an hour and 15 minutes. Strain and defat the braising liquid, then reduce it to a glaze with some sesame oil. To finish, glaze the ribs in batches in a hot oven until nicely caramelized. From America's Desk Kitchen to your kitchen, a killer recipe for Chinese style barbecued spare ribs. Thanks for watching America's Test Kitchen. What'd you think? Well, leave a comment and let us know which recipes you're excited to make, or you can just say hello. You can find links to today's recipes and reviews in the video description. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you later. I'll see you later.